Brother Tim was looking at me like he was expecting me to fall over as I started to get up. <laughs> we are going to get the commercial out of the way first. Just like, you know, any missionary, we all have our own commercials. But first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Maranatha Baptist Church for their prayers and cards that I received um, as a result of the, the surgery that I had. It was uh, very kind of you to be sending the cards and to pray. Still going to have a long ways to go, at least that's what everybody tells me. But uh, getting there a little bit every day as long as my uh, painkillers don't run out. And uh, somebody asked me this morning if I was kicking up a storm. There might be a storm, but I'm definitely not kicking. There's a, you, they say you, you, you're never too old to learn something. Well, now having experienced a, a prosthetic knee, I can understand what other people have, have gone through. But uh, the grace of God is still sufficient, amen? Um, so I, I thank you for your prayers. I in particular would like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Jeff Trun for taking me down to the Baltimore VA hospital for the surgery and then picking me up later and, and bringing me home. I'd also like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Bradley Lee for um, taking me back down there to have the, the staples taken out. Uh, that was uh, appreciated also. By the way, what's going on in the ministry there at Pilgrim Fundamental Baptist Press, we now have a new Spanish track available. It's the John 3.16 track. It was translated by a brother in Medellin, Colombia. And as a matter of fact, I talked to him about a week or so ago. Somebody asked me if I had any Christmas tracks in Spanish. It never occurred to me to even try to have any translated. And so I asked the brother about this, and he, he thinks he can get at least one track translated in time to use this year. We won't be able to, to send them out of the country. They'll never get there in time, but perhaps we'll have them in time to use here in the States. So I sent him down uh, two Christmas tracks, and I'm expecting sometime this week to at least get one of them back translated into Spanish. We also have two new gospel tracks available in Kachi. I don't think anybody in here knows anyone that speaks or reads Kachi, but Fran Eaches, a retired missionary that worked for over 50 years with the Kachi people in Cabana Alta Vista, Guatemala, she uh, translated these. She's translated a number of our tracks into the Kachi language. And let's see, we've got 3,000 Spanish tracks going out this week to Medellin, Colombia. The brother down there asked if I could send him a box of tracks. It's expensive sending tracks out of the country. To send 3,000 tracks, it'll cost us about $70. But right now we've got the money in checking, so I've got the tracks printed up. I'll cut them tomorrow, and then uh, they'll be on the way down to Columbia later this week. And we also just sent 300 Gospels of John over to Guam. I have no idea what the man over there does with these. He's ordered quite a few thousands of these over the years, but he's this week he's receiving 300 more. And the last thing in our little ministry commercial, I've asked uh, in... In Sunday school, a couple weeks for prayer for the finances for the church house for Yere Martinez in San Pedro Sula, Guatemala, or Honduras. Um, I need to finish my cup of coffee out in the car. That's why I messed up on what country. In, in <laughs> Honduras, he, um, th th they need this building desperately. They have outgrown the facility that they're in. If everybody that would normally come to a service there, if they all showed up at the same time, people would have to be on the outside. They would have to stand outside. There would not be room enough inside for them. And so the Lord graciously provided the money to buy the land. They uh, paid $5,000 for the permissions from the city of San Pedro Sula to do everything that they need. And some money has come in. They've started construction. Um, right now, they, they've got the, um, the, the footer in place, and they're starting to lay blocks for the walls, for the first floor. And so we really would appreciate if y'all would uh, pray about this. He came in the beginning of this week, and that's already been sent by MoneyGram down to him. Anything that 
is given, 100% of that is sent, and my ministry pays the MoneyGram fee. So if, if you give $100, $100 will be sent on. So we really would appreciate you all uh, praying about that. Now, getting to the Word of God. I'm sure anybody that's ever preached would understand what I'm about to say. You have a message that's on your heart. You don't particularly want to preach it, but you can't get away from it. A number of months ago, I read a sermon outline by a man by the name of Jabez Burns. He was an old-time preacher, lived from 1805 to 1876. He was over in England, and he preached a message. And I have a book of sermon outlines. I was going through it one day, just out of curiosity, and I came across this, and as I read it, I was so moved by what I read in that outline. I have read through it many times. One day I was sitting at my desk and reading through it, and as I got down to the bottom of it, it's out of the book of Ezekiel, and as I got down to the bottom of it, all I could say was, Lord, I don't want to be like this. So in one sense, this is a hard message for me to preach, and I can't get away from it. During the night when I wake up because of this nonsense with the knee and I'm not sleeping, I don't know how many times I have preached this message in my mind at night. I don't know what's going to come of it this morning, but I do know it's something the Lord laid on my heart. I must preach it. I can't get away from it. We're in Ezekiel, chapter 33. Looking down at verses 30 to 32. Ezekiel, chapter 30, 33, verses 30 to 32. And he said unto thee, as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. But with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on the, an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not." Then over in Mark chapter 7 and verse 6, Christ is speaking. He's talking about the Pharisees there. And he said, He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now, Heavenly Father, you know me better than I know me. And you know I can't do diddly squat, Father, without your help. And I sure would appreciate a lot of help from thee as I preach this message this morning. If there's anybody that's coming in this auditorium or listening by way of radio or over the Internet and they're not saved, I pray that thou would use this message to do a work in their heart to draw them to repentance and faith in the shed blood of Christ and that they would be saved before it becomes eternally too late. Perhaps there are those who, even though are saved, have been just playing church. I pray, Father, that playing would come to an end and we'd be serious about living for Thee. Whatever comes as a result of this message, I pray it would be for all of Thy honor and Thy glory. For I ask in Christ's name for His sake. Amen. This sermon outline is not an original. I won't tell you what it is but I have reworked it somewhat. I made some changes in this outline. As I said a moment ago, I have not been able to get away from it. Human nature is the same in all ages, so the very follies and sins of the ancients we see developed around us every day. Were there skeptical uh, people then, like Pharaoh? Yes, we have those even today. Were there daring blasphemers? <laughs> oh, yeah. We've got an abundance of those today. How about degraded prolificates? So now. Frivolous and thoughtless persons? So now. Were there others observing the established standards of good or proper behavior or manners and the decencies of life? Yes, and so there are now. Were there also then formalists, men who had only the name and externals of religion? Oh yes, we have a 
a huge abundance of those even now. So who will not perceive that the prophet's description is just as close and searching and true in reference to the multitudes now as it was when he uttered it in reference to Israel of old? Now, it's in this way that God's word becomes not only a true record of past events and a faithful describer of human conduct, but it is a clear and transparent mirror of the human heart and character. Every man must thus see his own likeness reflected in the spirit and doings of some order or class of persons who lived in, in the ages past. The chief value of this department of God's word arises from its vivid portraits of the human heart. And as we do read in God's word, we see a portrait of ourselves, do we not? Now, a considerable portion of the masses who give external attendance to outward worship, we fear may see their true state in the picture our text presents. Now, happy, if thus seeing it, they may be led to feel the great importance of becoming spiritual worshipers as God can only accept and be pleased with such. So we've got three major areas now we want to look at. Number one, what is commendable? Number two, what is blameworthy? And number three, the cause assigned for it. So let's look first of all at what's commendable. There is attention to divine things. Now, as I am preaching this message, I'm going to use a few words that we would consider to be somewhat archaic. One of the words that will be used in there is the word sanctuary. Many people refer to where we're assembled now as a sanctuary. I'm not Catholic. This is an auditorium. The sanctuary, I find, according to the Bible, for the believer, is that heart. So this is an auditorium, but many people still will refer to it as a sanctuary. We also will come across the word Sabbath. Some people refer to Sunday as a Sabbath day, no, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Always has been, always will be. But there are still those that want to refer to as Sunday with, as the Sabbath. They regard the Sabbath. They regard the sanctuary and therefore were not rejectors or de despisers of divine things. And we can say how proper and right is all of this. God ought to be worshipped and his holy ordinances should be regarded. He demands this, and it is like our duty and privilege to be obedient to his commands. I don't think anybody who is truly born again would disagree with that. How beautiful and hopeful is this course when contrasted with those in whose thoughts God and divine things have no place. People who ask, who is the Lord that I should serve him? Or what profit will there be in calling upon him? And we still have that attitude today among many people, and I fear sometimes even among Christians. What, what's it going to profit me if I call unto him? A man who neglects yielding homage and worship to the Most High is both guilty of great impiety and practical atheism. Let all men thus act, and God would have no intellectual recognition of his own world. But our text describes a class who do acknowledge God, who do honor his name and attend to his worship and ordinances. But we're going to observe. Pharaoh asked Moses the same question when he said, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. That was from Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And that's what many of the people in this world today are saying. Who is this God that I should obey him? And I fear that even in the lives of those who have been truly born again are in attitude and perhaps even in conduct saying the same thing. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? The more we get into the word of God and read about this God, this God who gave his son to die on the cross of Calvary to pay our sin debt, who is he? He's God Almighty. And as we heard in Sunday school a few weeks ago, every single person who knows Christ as personal Savior will stand before him and give a personal account. Now, my wife and I have been married for 
we're in our 50th year. My wife is not going to give me an account for me. Now, she knows me better than anybody in this auditorium. But she's not going to give an account for me, and I'm not going to give an account for her. Each one of us will give an account for ourselves. I read in the Bible, and I find out who this God is. And Pharaoh found out who this God is. But if I understand my Bible correctly, and I'm pretty sure I do, Pharaoh is in a devil's hell for all eternity. He learned. He learned a lesson the hard way. Their spirit and demeanor are serious and reverential. They are not light and trifling. They are not slumberers. They are not charged with forgetting what they heard. But they are serious and grave and reverential as far as God's people are concerned. No human eye can discern any difference. They come to God, says the prophet, as thy people. Here with the same apparent interest and concern. How proper and pleasing is all of this. Be a becoming demeanor in the sanctuary is most important. And it is. I don't see the church auditorium as a place where people come in and children just go running up and down. This is the church house. We've come here for a purpose. This room that we're in is not a playground, amen? For where should there be lowliness of spirit and veneration of the soul, if not in the presence of Jehovah? And how reprehensible the conduct of those who in the sanctuary seem as thoughtless and giddy as though they were in the ballroom or some place of worldly display, where it is evident to gaze abroad and attract the observation of others. And I've been in church services where somebody might be sitting over here and they might have a, a friend. It could be a girl or she's got a girlfriend or maybe a boyfriend sitting over there and they're trying to get the attention of one another. That's not what this place is about. I've seen it when I've been out there on the mission field in different churches, you know, how even some adults conduct themselves. This is not some place of worldly display where it is evident to gaze abroad and attract, as I said, the observation of others. This is the chief end in view. But those who are brought before us in the text are distinguished for the utmost external decorum. And they come and hear and sit, even as God's people. They appear to love divine things. With their mouth, they show much love. That is, much love to God and His service, to His house and to His people. They speak kindly and affectionately of religious things. So this is really encouraging. How really gratifying to the preacher and the people. It is not unusual, however, for us to come in contact with this warm and ardent praise of approval of public religious services where there is the complete absence of spirituality of mind. Men love music and they enjoy the service of song. So far, what we're really seeing is a lot of external. They love eloquence, and they are delighted with the addresses of the preacher. I believe we find this to be so in some of, um, I'm going to use the word high church, where everything is so formalistic, and the eloquence of the speaker. Now, y'all know me, I'm not a great orator. I'm just a country boy out of a coal mine in town. Nothing more, nothing less, no brag, just fact. So if you're looking for eloquence, you come to the wrong place. You won't find it in this boy. But there are those that love the eloquence. They love the addresses of the preacher. They are eminently social, and they love to mingle in the assembly of God's people. And we do find where people just, you know, they're just calmly running around. They're, they're mingling. They, they love that fellowship. But alas, after all, they are only outward court worshipers and never venture into the holiest of all or hold communion of heart with the living God. And sometimes I wonder, do we come here as a church body in worse, like in the outward court? We talk, we sing, we fellowship, we have a quote unquote, a good time. But have we really desired to enter into that intimate fellowship with the God who gave himself and saved us? 
They enjoy and are delighted with divine things. In verse 33, 32, And lo, they are unto them as a very lovely song. If you read closely in the text, you will find that people were encouraged to come and hear this preacher. And many of them did. They praised the preacher. What a wise man, they exclaimed. What an excellent man. How eloquent. How original. How edifying. What a treat to hear him. There is, in fact, no end to their eulogies. And we have no reason to suspect their sincerity. We just lost a man who, I believe, preached from the heart. I enjoyed listening to Jamie Grooms preach. I believe he was spot on with what he was preaching. I believe he, in listening to the messages, he did his homework. He studied and he preached. And how many times we would hear amens across the congregation. But when the last closing words of the benediction were given and we left the church house, what we were saying amen to and enjoying, did we leave it inside when we went outside? Or did we take it with us to meditate upon it? They no doubt in some sense feel and mean what they say. Some re receive the word with manifest joy. It acts upon them as an intellectual or an emotional stimulant. It tells upon their lively imaginations or nervous temperaments, or it occurs, accords with their theological predilections or religious convictions. Now, these are all commendable so far as they go, but they are all the while at an immeasurable distance from the true and saving piety. And the root of the matter is not in them. However, Cheering it may be to witness the conduct they exhibit, yet observe the serious failure related in the text. And this leads us to notice in their spirit, in their conduct, number two, what is blameworthy. It's quiet in here this morning. What we have seen so far is right, that the first charge against them is that they are not practical hearers. They hear thy words, but they will not do them. We read that in verse 31. They hear and they understand and they know their duty, but will not do it. Not that they cannot do them, for then it would be their misfortune. Duty always conveys to us the idea of a ability possessed or attainable, and where there is neither, there can be no moral obligation, but they can, and they ought to do, to, to do them, but they will not. It is our wills that are at fault. It says, ye will not come unto me, said Christ. Ye will not come to me. They are all by threatenings, but do not flee from their sins. They are moved by earnest reasoning, but do not yield their hearts to God. They are affected by invitations, but they do not come and return to the Lord with repentant minds and penitent hearts. They are pleased with divine things and wish to be counted God's people, but will not in heart and life serve him. They may have good desires and good resolutions and good purposes, but they do not obey God's word. A grave and fatal deficiency. Remember the necessity of being not hearers only, but doers. We read this over in James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We need to be not the hearers only, but the doers. So while there is much to admire, how much more to censure and condemn? How sad is this exhibition? Yet, it's not the state of the multitudes that go to God's house and worship as his people. If such be a fearful condition of many who go up to the service of God's house, how needful it is that we should cherish the spirit of self-examination, lest we should deceive ourselves and, like the foolish virgins, find that the last door of hope is closed against us. Over in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, we read about doing that self-examination. 
that wise King David in that psalm, he talked about, where can I go to be away from God? I, no matter how high I go, he's there. No matter how low I go, no matter where I go, he's there. But he wanted God to examine his heart. He wanted to do a self-examination. He didn't ask somebody else to examine him. He came before God and wanted God to examine him. And if there was any root of bitterness in him, anything at all, he wanted it removed. And in the sanctuary, we may well present the following thoughts to God in earnest prayer. Now, mighty God, thine arm reveal and make thy glory known. Now let us all thy presence feel and soften hearts of stone. Send down thy spirit from above, thy saints may love thee more. And sinners now may learn to love who never loved before. Furnish us all with light and powers to walk in wisdom's ways. So shall the benefit be ours, and thou shalt have the praise. Let's look briefly now at number three, the cause, a sign. And I fear that this is where, shall we say in the vernacular, the rubber meets the road. The chickens come home to roost, as we sometimes hear it said. Now, various are the hindrances to the acceptable and profitable worship of God. There's no one cause that operates upon all. With one, it may be unsettledness and dissipation of mind. With another, it may be listlessness and apathy of spirit. But with a third person, it may be want of self-application and serious reflection or inattention and forgetfulness. But the text speaks of one prevailing evil in the days of the prophet, an evil which we fear is yet very common and very fatal to profitable worship. Their heart goeth after covetousness. We see this illustrated in the parable of the sower. We read this from Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unprofitable. I wonder in our churches today how many covetous uh, people that we, we have. They're choked out by the, the cares, the, the things of this world, the riches that choke out the word. I read from Matthew 19, verses 21 and 22, where we see also in the young ruler to whom Christ said, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. If God came to any one of us and said, I want you to give up every single thing that you have to follow me, how many of us can honestly say that we would be willing to do it without reservation? He gave us all for us. I mean, I don't know how much more God could give. He gave his son, and his son gave his life. He gave his blood on the cross of Calvary. He did it for every single one of us, not only for us who know him as personal Savior, but for all of those outside the fold who have never repented and trusted him. He did it for them because of his great love. But yet he comes to us and he says, he wants our all. What would happen if he were to take away our health? And then we just have absolutely no, no health at all to speak of left. Could we still say, I love you, Lord? I'm willing to serve you, to do whatever you want me to do with my last breath? Your mind does funny things to you when you lay in a hospital bed, especially at night. Some of the longest nights I've had were in a hospital room. It seems like morning will never come. I think of that, and I think when I was on active duty, like when I was stationed at Fort Bragg, we'd be on guard duty at night. The nights were so long. 
It's like we would be wishing and praying for morning to come. It's like daylight is, where is it? A hospital room late at night. It's dark. Nothing's happening. And you have plenty of opportunity to think. And you have plenty of opportunity to pray. But if God were to take away our health, if he were to take away, I'll use this word loosely, our fortune, however much or however little it might be, if he were to take it all, and we were absolutely penniless, less than the, the homeless on the street, could we still come before God and, and bow our hearts and say, oh God, thank you for all that you've given me? What would our attitude be? And that rich young man, he couldn't part with it. No, in his mind and attitude, Christ was not worth it. There is no record in the Bible that he ever got saved. And therefore, I must conclude, he's now in a devil's hell. He's got plenty of opportunity, but he's eternally too late. We notice that diligence, prudence, and frugality are all in unison with Christian virtues. But covetousness is the inordinate desire of the heart for some earthly attainment. It may be for riches. If so, they that will be rich fall into diverse temptations. The love of mammon and the love of God are opposites. Opposites. I cannot love mammon, whatever it might be, and I cannot love God at the same time. The two cannot be on the throne of my heart. It's either going to be the mammon, whatever it might be, or it's going to be God, one or the other. It may be an inordinate desire for worldly fame, the honor and approbation of men. If so, we cannot supremely desire God's favor and seek intensely the approbation of men. In all cases, a covetous spirit, whether it goes after riches or fame, hardens the heart. The more I am going to seek after fame, the more I'm going to seek after riches, success in life, whatever it might be, the more I pursue that, the more it's going to harden my heart against God. It is the moral hardening of the soul. It destroys sympathy, tenderness, generosity. Any class of men are more easily impressible than the covetous. It closes the heart against God's good spirit and his supreme claims. There cannot, cannot be two on the throne of the affections. Gold and God. If covetous, then God is excluded. I personally would rather be the poorest of the poor and have God than be the richest of the rich and not have God. With all due respect to President-elect Donald Trump, with his billions of dollars, as far as I know, he does not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. He is, in my estimation, a very poor man. But yet, we see people that are, by world's definition, by worldly standards, they are the poorest among the poor, and they know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. They are wealthy. They have an inheritance. It's over in glory land. So they're going through a little bit of poverty right now. But one day, as a prince, they'll be reigning with King Jesus over in glory land. And to me, that makes it all worth a while. We may further add that this inordinate earthly spirit tends to moral darkness of the soul. It deceives the heart. It is a respectable vice. Other sins are generally disreputable. Seldom covetous, so. If people reason thus, I seek to improve my condition, my conduct, and pursuits injure no one. To which we reply, covetousness robs the whole world and your own soul also. It is a deceiving vice. It hoodwinks the moral perceptive powers and darkens the mind to its own destruction. Everything that hardens the heart must do so. So that if covetousness could exist alone and have no companion sin, it would effectually exclude all acceptable religion and finally sink the soul into endless perdition. No covetous person can enter into the kingdom of God. 
It simply will not happen. If you say, I disagree, I disagree with you, Brother Sharaka, then please open your King James Bible. None of those other perversions out there. You open your King James Bible and show me a verse. Then and only then will I agree with you. But I have read through the Bible, as I'm sure many, probably most of you have, and I have yet to find anything like that in God's Word. So in conclusion, we can learn how necessary is self-inspection. Now, wait a minute. I didn't say for me to inspect my wife or my wife to inspect me. I didn't say for Lee Larson to inspect me or for me to inspect Brad Lee or Brother Freeze over here or Brother Kite. No, I didn't say about inspecting somebody else. I said self-inspection. And self, a true self-inspection, I am convinced, only takes place when we get on our face before God and say, God, you show me where I'm wrong. Reveal it to me, and then give me the grace to fix it. Examine our hearts and know ourselves fully and honestly and how needful is real earnestness in religion, experimental piety, that which gives the whole heart and soul to God, to withhold our intellect or affections or profession or practice of holiness from God, is to rob him of his righteous and just claims. We say to those who are desirous of possessing what is truly good and precious, covet earnestly the best gifts. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, second Secondarily, <coughs> prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings. Helps. Governments. Diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the same gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 27 to 31. There are things really worth having, intrinsically valuable, and the possession of which is right. I can even say, yea, most laudable to desire, and that with all your hearts. There is divine favor, which is better than life, the the holy influences of the divine spirit and the full plenitude of that grace which is treasured up in Christ for all of his people. Be careful not to be content with being, quote, unquote, as his people, but be of the number who are truly his children, truly are. And see to it that while attendant on the outward forms of piety that we seek and attain to its inward spiritual and vital power, and thus God himself will be the rich portion and everlasting joy of our souls. In other words, we're not coming into a church house and sitting here singing our songs and putting our money in the plate and having a good time and it all being an outward form of piety. I'm not even sure I like that word. Maybe we can get an executive order from the new president and have that struck from the English language. That and a few other words. In our churches today, I observe that we have people who only grace the church house door once a week with their presence. Sometimes they show up at the church house and they make it like, oh, man, hey, you people ought to be so blessed that I'm here today. Oh, come on, that dog go hunt. But there are people who claim to be Christians. They can only find it in their heart to come to the church house once a week. I don't know what to do with the rest of their time. Be it to put on the idea that we love God. I think of a man in another country. I think I know him fairly good. He shows up once a week for Sunday school only and almost without exception. I say on a scale of 1 to 10, I make it a 12. He's late with his wife. I do not for the life of me understand why he even bothers to go. But I do know he hears the word of God. That I know for a fact. 
But there are people, we find them in America, they may go to the church house once a week. How many people are assembled here this morning that will not be here tonight? Now, I understand that we get to a situation where some people become elderly and their vision is very poor at night for driving. I understand that. I didn't come in today's mail. And so they cannot drive. We, some people, they have a physical ailment. It makes it exceedingly difficult for them to get out. We understand that. Some have jobs. I understand. Mrs. Cox is a nurse, and she may be called in to work. Can't make it. We understand that. Brother Freeze may be called out on an emergency. Can't make it. But why is it that we can make it out on Sunday morning, but we can't make it out Wednesday night, and we can't make it out Thursday night? And yet we say we love the Lord. Is it just me? Is there something bad wrong? People can get to work on time, but they can't get to the church service on time. If they showed up for work habitually late, how long would they be on the job? Why can't we make it? If our church services are so important, if I honestly believe that God wants me in his house, and then I need to be here, if it's that important, why can't I be here on time consistently? But yet, to have a job, if I'm supposed to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be there maybe even a few minutes early when I clock in. You understand what I'm saying, folks? Is it just me? I don't think it's just me. Church is important. I know some of you will be mad at me and say, I'm not going back tonight. I'm not going to listen to that guy again. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. I wouldn't listen to me either. I'm just going according to what my Bible teaches. And I believe I should be here tonight, not just because I'm preaching. People are not faithful with their tithe, if they tithe at all. We come in, we have the outward form of everything that goes on, but I'm such a tightwad, I don't want to give my tithe. And if I do put anything in the offering plate, I'm going to do it grudgingly. Every man, according as he prospereth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. When C.T. Studd and his wife were going to the mission field, he was a man of, uh, he was very wealthy, a man of means. And he concluded in his heart, and his wife, and he, they sat down and they talked about it. God has given us all this money. We're going out here on the mission field. We're going to go out here and we're going to live by faith. It is recorded that they sat down and they wrote checks. Individuals, ministries, all around the world. Um, just had a brain cramp. The guy in uh, England that had the, uh, the home for boys. George Mueller. Mueller was a recipient of some of that money. They were giving away the money. And it's recorded that they started laughing. They be, literally became hilarious in writing and giving that money. Does this sound like it was somebody that gave grudgingly? Hey, when that offering plate comes, no matter if I put in a dollar, a hundred dollars, or a thousand dollars, whatever amount I put in that plate, it's going to the Lord. I give it from the heart. It should be with cheerfulness. And if I can't give cheerfully, I question whether or not I should give at all. Now, does God need my money? No. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, and he can sell one of them beef critters anytime he wants to to meet the need. But he gives us the privilege of participating in the offering. People who are not concerned enough about lost souls to even try to witness to them or even to give a gospel tract. We'll come into the church. And as I mentioned, reference Pastor Grooms a little bit earlier. He preached from the heart encouraging people, challenging people. How many of us came in and sat in here, we took it in, we may have even said amen, we walked out the door and never even had enough of a concern of a lost person to try to witness to them or to share a gospel track. And yet I want to go around singing songs about how much I love and praise the Lord. Does that make me a hypocrite? 
If it does, I might get an Academy Award. People who do not pray or even bother to read their Bible. I won't ask how many people bother to read their Bible or pray. But if I understand my Bible correctly, and I'm pretty sure I do, I'm to read my Bible, and I am to pray. God is my Father, my Heavenly Father. And He seeks us, as we read in Hebrews, to come boldly before the throne of grace in time of need. I can bring my needs to Him 24-7. Now, all of us have children, I'm sure. Children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, people like that. But they cannot always get in contact with us for whatever reason. My phone might be off. God never turns off his phone. He's always there waiting. He's waiting for me to come in prayer to talk to him. 24-7 at night when we can't sleep. Father, I don't know why I'm awake tonight. It may be he wants us to pray for somebody. There might be a missionary out there in the field that he'll lay on our heart. How many of us prayed, even coming to church this morning, to get a blessing or something out of Sunday school or the morning preaching hour? I wasn't here for the recital Friday night, but I did pray that the people who come would get a blessing, that the kids would perform real good. See, I believe God does answer prayer. And I know probably most every person in this auditorium believes in God answers prayer. We don't want to be like the formal and unprofitable worshipers. That was the title that Javis Burns gave to his original outline, formal and unprofitable worshipers. He said in Chapter 33, verse 31. And they come unto thee as thy people cometh, and they set before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. I read that. I told you, I read through that outline so many times. I, that one day I sat there in my office. I was reading through it, and I got down to the bottom, and all I could say was, Lord, I don't want to be like that, and I don't. I'm not going to say I know my heart, because the Bible says no man can know his own heart, but God knows my heart. I don't want to be a formal worshiper. I don't want to be an unprofitable worshiper, no matter where I'm at. I'm, I'm just speaking for, my, for myself. I told the people in San Pedro Sula in September one of the messages that I preached at the end of the message. I want to be whatever God wants me to be. But I don't want to be like these people that we're reading about here. I do not want to be formal and unprofitable. I pray that that is the desire of people in this auditorium today those brothers and sisters who might be listening over the radio or possibly the internet, you do not want to be formal and unprofitable. You don't want to be like those who come in and set to come in, sing the songs, have a good time, fellowship, put the money in the plate, whatever, and then leave and go back to a typical way of life. But people who are sold out for God, no matter what it is he wants you to do, if I understand my Bible, God gave his all for us. We could give our all for him. We're going to have an invitation hymn that Brother Dow is going to come and lead in. You'll find it in page number 516 is your all on the altar. Heavenly Father, I have no idea if I...